Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we we had a really good session a couple of weeks ago with Chanel Lewis uh, from Richmond. I, I thought her presentation was really thorough and the work they're doing there is really critical. I also thought that her overview of the both the successes they've had as well as the challenges was very honest and I think gave us a glimpse of, of of what we might expect here locally. Um, so I, I, I thought we could talk a little bit about any insights that, that you all may have gleaned from, from that session. And then today, I thought we would just dive right into what I think is our, uh, our first priority, and that's to uh, review how we want to um, get at this comprehensive gang reduction model by the end of January and set forth some uh, specific tasks to help us get there and then to check in on some of the other efforts that we're working on. Um, this, is, this is a lot of big stuff, but I think if we can take it in some sections, it will help us get to where we, where we want to be. Um, so first, any um, any insights or thoughts uh, as follow up to our session with Chanel a couple weeks ago? Well, I, I think I'll reiterate, uh, I think one of the questions I asked her um, around scope. And, and I think as we look at the model, uh, it, it may behoove us to Take that in consideration. You know the breadth of what they were trying, some success, some not so successful, and if we can somehow try to scale it down to, uh, you know, what's what's the most important and what's the most impactful thing that we can kind of carve out initially, you know, as a team and try to go after that in that manner. I, I think in, 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 in an initiative such as this. It's important to the community to to get some islands of success as quickly as possible. You know, and not that we want to rush it through, but really want to try to say, you know, what are we doing? How are we implementing? How are we going about doing it? And then showing some progress towards that. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And, and I think alongside that, figuring out how we can communicate our progress so that we keep the community engaged in, in the work that we're doing. Um, the, um, the, the marketing messaging strategy session that was gonna be this week, we've actually bumped out to um, December 16th. And, and so I'll be, um, I'll be sending out additional information regarding that but wanted to let you all know that. Uh, any other insights or follow-up from, from the session with uh, Chanel a couple weeks ago? And I also plan to send out that, we're gonna post that recording to, the, um, to our website, but I'll make it available to you all should you wanna be able to go back and listen to it. I think one of the things that I took away was the importance of the collective impact model and the work that they're doing there, the, um, the importance of having the right people at the table and everybody having an understanding um, and an agreement on the direction that things are going. It was interesting when she talked about um, sort of people getting credit for the work and being concerned about that um, for us to know that that was um, a stumbling block they experienced and to be prepared for it. I really appreciated her letting us know sort of what they tripped over um, a little bit in that implementation to, so that we can learn from their experiences. Um, but I think it's an important conversation to have about who do we think really needs to be in the conversation um, and be ready to do the work with us. I don't, I, I think we have a great team here, but I don't know that it's quite robust enough to be what we need it to be to put, put this work in. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, Jamie, they had, a, um, this was great from DCGS. When they first started the Inspire Work Group, 
It started as the prevention arm of the Juvenile Justice Collaborative, which is the JJC for the city. Um, and that's so top level as a collaborative because you have all the agency heads from different social services, judges, Commonwealth attorney. The Inspire work group was created as a, a transition from the, um, the old health department director to the new health department director. And the other thing was let's get folks in the community to be a part of Inspire. Um, as what Chanel didn't mention is that there was some transition heartburn um, because the top level folks believe that, you know, there's a lot of movement going on in, on the lower level and their meetings was at night. And a lot of folks didn't want to, come, you know, attend those meetings, but those meetings were well heavily attended. Um, so <laughs> you get some friction where the JJC will have about you know, a lot of folks coming in place of a director and there was not a lot of movement, whereas the Inspire started to take off like a rocket ship, um, only because the community was, you know, they were like ready to do something, um, which was, um, it started, you know, what she, what she will tell you is that there took some meetings in between meetings with the chair of the um, JJC, which is the chief judge and um, the court service unit director and some human service officials from the city to understand that there is a, there is some, um, there is a will from folks in the community to really try to address gun violence, to really try to do something with our youth. And we can't be so top heavy or talk over folks as a poll, because they don't really understand what juvenile justice system works. Um, and it get turned off by sometimes, you know, coming to those meetings at the Juvenile Justice Collaborative um, and help and having them to explain to them, you know, what are risk factors, what are the assessment tools, um, which is good. But when we start looking at what's going on in the community, you know, those things are sort of, um, they fall on deaf ears when you see people impacted by crime. So, um, and that was like a communication um, barrier between the uh, prevention arm, because there's about five different subgroups of the JJC, uh, prevention, intake, diversion, um, alternative to detention. So it just, it was, it, it grew real fast and um, it has some real good um, participation from folks in the community. I think that's really important. Um, it, it, it almost feels like parallel uh, efforts, but they have to connect at some point and um, I know that even, you know, the timing of some of our overall task force meetings during the day has been prohibitive for some community members to participate um, just because of the timing and, and their other work schedule. It, it, I appreciate you all being here because I think our, our schedules allow for some of that flexibility. Um, but I think we have to keep that in mind and and I do think the community, there's a sense in the community of wanting to be active in, in this work and wanting to make a difference. And so figuring out how to both bring together um, these collaborative partners as well as community partners and stakeholders, I think is part of the strategy that we need to look at in, in this model. You know, um, Joe, I'd be interested in um, having the uh, recording, I had to get off very quickly because of a death in the congregation. Um, but uh, I was on until about 11. And one of the things that um, hit me that you talked about was uh, sort of having a laser focus on a particular age group. I think, I think she talked about 18 to 24. Am I correct about that? That's, that sounds right. I, I... Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I, you know, I don't know if we want to do that, if we want to break it up into like maybe 14 to 18, 18 to 24 and have two laser focuses. Um, but in listening to her, it became very clear to me that um, to a great extent, the uh, we need to do preventative measures with younger students but that we should probably look um, at the statistics and say, okay, what is the age group of the greatest gun violence that we're experiencing? 
and at least in a first year program, let's be laser focused on that age group. I, I know that during, it was, I don't know if it was, I think it was two of our task force meetings ago. Um, now Sergeant Johnson gave some information on um, both offenders and victims in terms of age groups. Mm -hmm. And I would have to go back and look at those notes, but it seems to me that as, as part of what you and Elliot both identified in terms of this laser focus and scope of our work, we should ask for some specific data um, related to these age groups. And, and I think it would help us to identify what kind of data we need. And do we just want to seek data from the police department based on incidents or are there some other sources we can turn to uh, through the juvenile justice department, uh, through the courts? Um, Greg, you might be helpful to us in this regard in terms of, of, of where we could access some of that data so that we have a bigger picture of what we're looking at. I, I also know that the schools are, uh, in fact, I think they've just started this week a, a survey that is trying to get at the social, social and emotional needs of children of, of all ages. I think it actually, I think it's third through 12th grade that they're doing these surveys through. And we should have results of those surveys back. And we've already gotten permission from the superintendent to be able to access that data. Um, that should come back to us after the first of the year sometime in January, which still aligns with our, our goal to, to have some, uh, something more comprehensive together by the end of January. Um, Greg, what, what other um, sources could we potentially tap into for this kind of a data or what do you think would be helpful for us to access? Um, I mean, you could start with like the Virginia State Police Annual Crime Report, which give you, um, juris, you know, detailed data for jurisdictions. And it will tell you what type of crimes, the age limit, uh, the age ranges of those victims and perpetrators. Um, I can forward it to you guys. Uh, they publish it every year. And then we also use the data resource guide that DJJ put out. Um, and that's broken down as by jurisdiction as well. Um, and that will give you the age range, types of offenses, um, and the race and gender of each person. Okay. Do I remember that she said their YRBS started asking questions around violence, Greg? Yeah, um, they had, City of Richmond used some of their data from their health department. Um, they also has a, um, what you call a criminal justice board uh, that is, I think Rona probably have one too, um, that oversees their pretrial probation. Um, and they had did a data dump as far as the types of offenses that were coming before the general district and circuit court um, and realized that the bang for their buck will be between, be between that 18 and 24 range of youth. Um, and mid-level adults. And our juveniles really weren't, they really didn't have any violent crime. There were like instances of violent crime, but the majority of the juvenile petitions were for violations and larceny and assaults. Um, when we start getting into the violent crimes is when we start seeing that 18, between that 18 and 24 year old range. Okay. So data is a big part of this uh, model development that we need to look into, as well as um, helping us identify that laser focus and the scope of our work. Um, Greg, Joe, I, I guess, another, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, another question I might ask is in that 18 to 24 year old range, um, is there a significant number of uh, individuals who had been previously incarcerated, either as juveniles, which might be harder to find out. Um, um, that will be, it's not hard to find out. Um, that's when you have, when you have a, like the juvenile justice collaborative, 
in Richmond, so to speak, the, um, you have dual memberships, those that serve on the Juvenile Justice Collaborative and those that serve on the local criminal justice board, um, which also presented itself an opportunity where they can share that data um, and see those kids that transition into the adult system after they turn 18. Mm -hmm. um, they were able to see that there were a, a parallel, those numbers of number of youth that continued into the criminal activity after they turned, you know, 18. Um, some had significant history in the juvenile court, others did not. Uh, there was probably like petty larceny and violations, but after they turned 18, some of the um, most violent crimes started to happen in their um, trajectory in, their, um, in the system, so. Um, and I think a, a good person um, that you might want to reach out to if you want to have some more information is Dr. Rhonda Gilman. She's the chair of the Juvenile Justice Collaborative and also oversees the um, pretrial probation services for adults for the city of Richmond. Um, and she did a lot of data dumping for, and I can give you, I can send you her information, uh, Vice Mayor Cobb. Yeah, okay. thank you. So I, I think, oh, hold on. Got somebody new coming in that I'm not sure. Um, so I, I think one of the challenges uh, in my mind right now is um, is figuring out just just some core next steps to get us to where we want to be by the end of January with this this comprehensive model approach. Um, I think some of that includes uh, being aware of and, and having some knowledge of other models. We've certainly heard uh, directly about two models locally, uh, Richmond and Danville. Uh, we've also, I, I've sent out um, some models um, that are more national in scope, but I think are indicative of some of the, the key areas we need to look at. And, and I don't know, to be honest, I have not had a chance to read through those. Um, and that may be accurate for, for the rest of us as well. Um, so I, I think some of this is research related. Uh, some of this is data related um, to determine um, our focus. And some of this is program related. Um, I know that when we presented this summary uh, to city council, uh, they were very encouraged by um, the work of the, the study committee as a whole and particularly our, our focus and, and, and trying to to do prevention work with youth. Um, and they, uh, at our recent budget retreat, there was affirmation of, of wanting to support funding uh, to help us get where we need to be with this. Uh, one of the questions that came up in a conversation I had yesterday with our city manager uh, was essentially this. Um, <clears throat> Do, do we think that um, it would be helpful there? I guess he asked, he asked this two, two different ways. Um, for this initiative, for this model to be effective, do we believe that having a dedicated staff person, i.e. A, a youth and gang violence prevention coordinator working alongside developing um, building out this model. Do we think that, that the two of those collectively working together would be helpful? Or do we think that it's more helpful to, to build out this initiative uh, with one of the goals being hiring a, a coordinator um, at some point? And, and the reason I ask that is because there's a lot of front end work um, I happen to have some time to dedicate to this, 
but I could see the benefit of somebody whose full-time job is dedicated to this, really helping navigate this effort. But I really need some direction from you all on how we want to move forward with this. This doesn't preclude us having a clear model in place by the end of January with movement out from there in clear steps. But I wanted to get a sense from you all what direction you think we would should take, what would be helpful. Um, because as we as as we're looking at budgeting, um, we want to see how how we can be most effective in this. So um, I was involved in some of the work around the collective impact around the opioid epidemic. And what we found was that having a full-time dedicated person to sort of organizing that work and getting people to contribute, do the things they said they were going to do, sort of to be the driver around that was really impactful for making progress in that area. So I think I advocate that we have a person that is able to dedicate the energy to, to making that happen. Yeah, I, I would agree with Jamie. I was going to say almost the same thing um, that, um, you know, Joe, I know that that you say you have time, but I also know that your hands are in a million things. Um, and to have somebody whose full dedication is this and allow you to uh, kind of be an overseer and, and get involved in the other things that, that you're doing would be very good. Um, I think quite honestly, that this is a full-time job. And I think that as we see um, violence rise in Roanoke, that uh, addressing it head on would be a uh, really positive step, um, especially um, now that we know how the police force has kind of restructured itself. I think there's a very good way to work together there with the um, I forget what they're calling it. It's not gang violence and recidivism, but whatever that grouping is that, that they put aside. Um, I think there's a natural in. Um, so I, I would say getting somebody on board who's the right person as soon as possible would be best. Any other thoughts on that? Well, the reason I ask that is because I think part of part of our work uh, in in finalizing this model would be also finalizing a job description, um, so that we could move forward with that. Um, I, we have one from Danville. Uh, I don't have one from Richmond. I'm sure we could get that um, from Chanel. Um, and there may be Greg. Do you know in the um, comprehensive models, are there any templates of job descriptions for these kinds of positions? Um, I'm not sure, but I can find out. I know that um, Newport News had an individual um, dedicated for youth violence and um, gang prevention. Um, and I could do some research to find out if they, um, I think they pulled that position underneath the police department. And uh, I'll find out and see if I can get some information to you. Okay. So uh, in terms of uh, next steps, um, we're the full committee is set to meet next Friday at um, 10 and we'll have working group breakout sessions again to do that. Um, would it be helpful for me to just bring together some of the key components that we've talked about today as a short list of tasks for us toward developing this model and send those out to you and then and then we can hone in on those uh, next uh, Friday. Um, I also think that uh, alongside that um, this data request list. Um, in fact, if we could get um, uh, Dr. Gilmer um, uh, to be part of a meeting coming up soon. Um, I can <clears throat> uh, work with you all to reach out to some of these local data sources, our health department, 
our, I'll, I'll have to find out who's connected with our criminal justice board here. Uh, Jim O'Hare may have some knowledge about some of these additional data sources that we can access through the juvenile justice department. But I think if we could pull together some of that information, even to have as early as, as next Friday, that could be really helpful to us. Um, does that sound like a good plan? Yeah, I think it's a good plan. And, um, you know, I can provide any, um, you know, data from, from our end, you know, if we're going to try to focus on 18 to 24 year olds, I may be able to pull some, um, some statistics from that too. That'd be great, Angela. That'd be very helpful. Elliot, do you have some stuff you want to add to this? No, I, I think it's, I think it's good. Um, and I, I do want to bring it up again. And I, and I think I might've glossed over it in an earlier meeting that, um, probation and parole, which we're in District 15, as far as the state's concerned, has a gang unit. And the supervisor over that is very interested in that. And I think we can gleam a lot from um, his participation as we move forward as well, from a data collection, uh, but also from a perspective of, of um, um, they see them when they're young, they see them because they, once they get involved with the justice system, you know, they're in some level of probation and parole. I right. think we're going to gain a, a, a fair amount of insight um, into the trajectory of youth to young adult, um, especially when it comes to preventive measures. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, Vice Mayor is okay, I'm going to try to connect you two first. Uh, to try to get him involved over here. I've already spoken with him. He's, he's excited about being a part of it. Right. But I think, you know, for Roanoke, um, again, I, I, I believe in, in the jails, I believe in what they're doing, um, but these are individuals who are solely focused on gangs and they touch these people all the time. They touch people when they come from different districts and come back in, but under supervision, what's happening what's going on. Um, I, I think it's gonna be a, a valuable resource, however we frame this going forward, however we target it, however we um, build the scope. Um, so I, I agree with it. Um, um, I agree with your, 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 your plan to kind of give us some points, give us what we need to do. Um, and I definitely, even though I didn't weigh in at the time, you know, agree that we need to build the infrastructure um, before we fight the war. Right. Good morning. I want to int introduce myself. I, I you see my name, Ed Holmes, and you probably think, who is this person? Um, I'm, <laughs> Hi, I, work with, I work with Greg Hopkins at DCJS. Oh, great. great. And I'm also the grant monitor for the gang initiative in Danville. So I just want to tell you who I was before you got a little too nervous, not knowing who Ed Holmes was. And so Greg and I work very closely together and uh, we'll be happy to provide you guys with any resources that we think you might need. Great. Um, Ed, what is your uh, email address? Um, Ed home, Ed dot homes at DCJS dot Virginia dot gov. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Thank I know, you. I know Jim O'Hare from a few other grants too. Okay. So, um, <laughs> I know a little bit about Roanoke. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Well, we, we you appreciate should know it. my, you should know yeah. my name, Ed. But I, I, I'm on. I'm the one that does the quarterlies for the grants that Jim has. So, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a small, it's a small world, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. So um, good to see you, Jamie. You as well, sorta. <laughs> Good well, to see your name on the screen. How about that? Yeah. In, in full transparency, Ed, when I saw your, your you come into the room, I thought, oh, I, I don't know who this is, but I'm glad they're here. And and Jamie just lit up. She said, so I knew that there was some recognition. Yeah, um, and, um, and uh, <laughs> I apologize for you know looking over your shoulder and not telling you who I was. That's but, all right. We're glad you're yeah, here. Yeah. Um, Elliot, what's the name of the? Uh, the probation and parole person that you're going to connect me with? Uh, you'll, you'll see it when I put on your but it's Brett Duncan. He's actually the 
senior PO over um, all of the um, gang probation parole officers. So okay. they're segmented between common stuff, gangs and sex offenders and everything else over here. So he's, he's uh, very well versed in uh, Rono and those people involved in certain activities that they shouldn't be involved in. Um, so he's got a long history here and, um, and he's excited about, um, you know, adding, you know, whatever benefit or input he can add to the, to the initiative. Okay. Thank you. So let's just to, as, as, as a way to kind of summarize today, um, help me recall um, the key things we're going to pull together to look at next week. This is kind of a group recall exercise <laughs> to help me focus. <laughs> I think for, for me, one of the most important things that, that you brought up was kind of redirection or redirecting away from this gang coordinator to more of how do we get a position that's more of developing the model that we want to adopt. I think for me, that's, that's, that's a huge takeaway from this morning's meeting because uh, structurally it's a little bit different than what we've initially discussed. So it's, it's essentially, I think we're, we're, we want to start with what we know locally uh, in terms of the data and the research and then out of that, identify the, the sort of inter infrastructure that we need and, and, and then the type of position that's uniquely um, dedicated toward this, this outcome that we want. Is that what I'm hearing you say, Elliot? Um, I think it's, it's a little bit different, at least for me. So don't, don't take it as- what That's all right. I'm just trying to you clarify. Know. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to say more of uh, whatever this, whatever the model we're going to have. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a person. In my experiences, is, is define what you want to do. You know, what I'm saying before you define who is going to be able to do it, because that dictates the skill levels or whatever you need to to say who's going to be on board. Um, and I've always had an issue, uh, which we cleared up a little bit uh, ago on. What model are we going to adopt? You know, what I'm saying what are the critical elements of the model that we're going to use? If we're going to, you know, and I and I did uh, read through the model that was was presented, um, which I seldom do, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I actually took the time and read through it, took notes, and you know, kind of said, okay, wow, this could work. Um, but then we may need to see how it, how it goes. So we need we need to say if this is the model that we're going to have. Who's going to manage implementation of this model? You know what I'm saying? Because as right. uh, someone else said previously, it's a full-time job just trying to coordinate, getting all of that built around that. You know, and I don't, I don't know all the elements. Don't pretend to know all the elements. Um, but there's got to be some work involved. Um, and, and I think having that type of person who's, you know, this issue is top of mind every day. When they walk in the office or walk whatever it is, they wake up. That's what they're thinking about. Which I can't, you know, I can only speak for myself. You know, while I enjoy this initiative, it's not the first thing every day that I have to think about. You know, um, there's other things. But for something is this important and this large, um, we need somebody who says this is what we want to be able to, to do every day. You know, and that and, and it may involve pulling the right data together. That's why I'm not saying get the data before you get the, the right. model, because right. hey, I've got the model. If I want to scope it, I only want to scope it with what the data is telling me I need to scope it to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So identifying the critical elements in the model first, what we want to do, yes. and then who's going yeah. to manage the, and, and then as part of that, you know, we can more specifically ask yeah. what type of research and data we need. That, that digs deeper yes. and then who's going yeah, to manage. And, Joe, I would clarify further that um, any amount of data that we can get before next week, um, and I don't, that might not be realistic. I mean, that's a short period of time, 
but anything that we could get would help us to kind of tweak that model towards what would work best in Roanoke. Okay. So I would kind of go data, tweaking the model, um, then moving forward to what our goals would be for that position and then um, writing the job description from there. So I, I guess my question to just take a step back is what model are we talking about? I mean, we've, we've, I've sent out several different models and, and I, don't, I don't have the ability right here in this moment to say these are critical elements in each of the models that we need to consider for our own model. Um, so I, I think it's gonna be really helpful or are we talking in, my, in terms of a model, are we talking about some of the action steps that we've already identified to be part of this model? For example, the comparable localities, um, identifying persons in the community who've emerged from gangs, training a mentoring team, creating educational programs. I mean, to me, those are all outcomes. They're not necessarily the model of how to get there. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, Elliot, which model did you read through? That might be a good starting place. I was, I was, I was thinking of the, the, last, the last one that you sent out. Um, uh, the other gentleman from the criminal justice department, he actually had a revision to that model. Um, it, it's, it spoke of the five elements. I'm trying to okay. quickly sweat through the emails to find it right now. Okay. I don't have everything. Um, but um, that's the that's the, the um, Greg, would that have been um, who's the gentleman that joined us last time? Was that Mark? Yeah, that was Mark Farrow. Um, yes. He has sent um, a list of different violence prevention models. I'm trying to go through my emails now, see if I was copied on something. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find it quickly for myself. So uh, that could at least give us a framework. And and if 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 there's that, you know, even if all of us could take a chance to read the model that has those five critical elements, I think that would all put, give us a, a starting place in terms of, of discussion. And I thought we were going to review it on one of the meetings and, and that's, I, I kind of prepared for that and be yeah. in a different direction, but. Um, well, and I think what we can do is, is include, file, we can include that in our, our meeting for next week is to review it as a starting place. As you've probably gleaned from, from my, my style, I, uh, um, I can administer when I need to. <laughs> I'm a very big picture idea person and honing into the details and, and getting us to the next task is where I rely on uh, those who are appropriately skilled in that area. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, to help us get there. <laughs> Joe, on um, November 19th, you sent out three different models. Mm -hmm. um, could I suggest that we all read through those models uh, before next week and maybe come with some ideas and notes that what we thought was good or not good in terms of applying it to Roanoke for each of those models? Sure. And I'll resend that out. Thank you for uh, identifying the date. And I can resend those links out along with that request. And it, and it was the one that I'm referring to is the OJJDP comprehensive game model. Okay, the first one then. Yeah, it's, it was the first of the three. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, they, they were all somewhat similar. I read through them quickly. Um, but I did read that first one a little bit more in depthly simply because it was the first link I clicked. Um, and, uh, I think it needs some tweaking, but it's very good. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I think if, if there's, if there's one thing that the gentleman who was on the call earlier, he, he sent out, he sent out something, he sent out a link and, and, I, and I apologize, I can't find it that quick. They sent out a link, but then he, he, or someone sent the link out and then said, this is the one that he authored. And it yes. looked like he refreshed 
Was right. the link in the chat? It, it, it I, might have been. You right. It might I, have been. I did send it out, and and in fact, I think it may be in that November nineteenth. It may have been the last one that was included, uh, but I'll go back. Yeah, and but uh, yeah, the earlier one was was good, but it was you could tell it was dated. And then when I read through his, it was like, oh, look, like he just kind of refreshed. <laughs> he right. did it for eight, right? Um, at the time, but it had some very distinct elements in it, which we could uh, pivot off of. You know, saying and, and adopting that. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the two I, I, I did find my notes from it um, when they talk about um, opportunities provisions, which to me um, I think is always one of the elements um, when it comes to gangs and the youth is finding another. People do things because they don't have the opportunity to do something different. Right. They're saying there's something more positive, and and that stood out to me. Uh, again, I thought hey, what are we gonna discuss this thing? I'm like, man, that's what we need to talk about. We need to talk about, so what do we have in our action plan that talks around opportunity provisions for reducing gangs and it not become just a law enforcement issue, but an opportunities issue? I, I think that's key. And I, I certainly, that's something I heard loud and clear from Chanel's presentation. That even even you know we we use the language of gangs, but a lot of youth that that she was working with, that's not part of their vocabulary. They don't even talk about it that way, and and so it was really indicative of their shift to to look at opportunities and where are the gaps in those opportunities that that could help be addressed. So I think that's a that's an important pivot for us to make. Okay, so I will. Uh, I Go ahead, Elliot. No, no, no. I'll say I'll, I'll I'll go back and refresh all of my notes now okay. that I do have the date that I was looking at. Yeah, so, they had to get the um, if you took a look at the Project Safe Neighborhood model or document that came out of the Attorney General's office, um, which was implemented, I believe, in Richmond, um, Tywood area, and I believe in the Western District. They did take the five strategies from OJJDP's uh, comprehensive gang model, which is suppression, social intervention, as you said earlier, opportunities provision and community mobilization, um, and then organizational change and development. Um, but again, you can take, you can take, actually you can glean from that model and you just go on OJJDP's website and just take whatever you think is gonna be um, applicable to Rono. Um, and and you can you can move from that point on. To be honest with you. Okay. So the key things I have are are identifying and and confirming the model, and we've we all have some homework to do in that regard to identify those key elements. Um, I'll resend the links. Uh, with those. Um, as part of that ongoing conversation, who is going to manage the implementation of the model? And that, that may include a staff person, it may include community stakeholders and community partners. Um, and then um, identify uh, some initial data that we have access to that, that could be brought into the meeting next week. That sound like enough for us to work on next week? Okay. Oh. All right, well, thank you all so much for your time today. And uh, we'll pull this together and I'll get it sent out to you and we'll look forward to being with you again uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.